Next up, we have Father Sean Kilcally. He's the director of the Office of Family Life for the Diocese of Lincoln. He was with us, I believe, the Easter Fervorino. Father Sean, thank you again for joining us this evening. Thanks, Steve. It's great to be with you tonight. And you are going to be talking to us again through that theme of freedom. But now we're moving next step to freedom to be a saint, as we've been saying from the very beginning of the evening. And you're going to lead us straight into adoration as well. And you have a bit of a prayer reflection for us in adoration. So I'm going to leave you to it. Thank you so much for being here. And everyone, we will see you next month, July 29th at the next Fervorino. Thanks, Eve. I'm just going to start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we invite you into this space and ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon us to bind us to our Lord Jesus Christ, that every thought, word, and work of ours may begin with you, and through you be happily completed through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> so it is a great joy to be with you all tonight. And uh, it's really humbling to follow Jason and Kristalina and Tori. They gave lots of really, really, really good things to to think and pray about. And um, and kind of as Tori was talking, I was thinking about in my thesis, I had a section on narrative theology. And Stanley Hauerwas is a theologian who talks about how conversion is when we find our own narrative within the narrative of Jesus Christ. So when we realize that our story is part of his story, and uh, which kind of goes to a different level, it means I, th the question isn't simply, do I know my story? It's also, do, do I understand that when Jesus tells his story, I'm part of it? You know, when our Lord tells his story, I'm part of it. So one of the questions that, that I often ask people in spiritual direction is, who is Jesus? And, and they might say, he's the savior of the world. He's the son of God. He's, you know, he's the guy who doesn't answer my prayers sometimes. Um, and then I'll ask, who are you to Jesus? If I ask Jesus, who is Bob, this guy sitting in front of me, what does our Lord say? And then people get really nervous. And sometimes the answer is something like, uh, I guess I'm his beloved son. I guess I'm his beloved son. Because that's really, like, what, what is our goal? Our goal is to know that. Our goal is to know that I'm his beloved son. And to be able to say that with confidence. And and freedom, as I've come to, un to know it in my life, has been more and more about freedom to be loved by our Lord. And and so so it's not only, like, the freedom to do what I want to do when I want to do it, or or the freedom from addiction, the freedom from fears, anxieties, worries. But it's also the freedom to rest in our Lord's love, um, because my own story is also a story of wounds. And, and as I as I tell this, I, I want to give a big disclaimer. And the big disclaimer is this: that you don't have to have a bunch of wounds. Um, sometimes when we hear talks about wounds, we think like people will come see me and they'll be like, "Father, I'm trying to figure out my wounds," and and they really don't have anything major. And I'm like, you know, you just might be okay. It's okay that you're okay. So for some of you, it's okay that you're okay. And, uh, and hopefully what we talk about tonight will help you to just simply grow in the spiritual life. Um, but, but I was thinking about the way I've handled my own stuff. And when I was in the Army, before I was in the seminary, I was an Army officer at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And, and at that time, my own sexual addiction was pretty escalated. And, and I was running towards lots of bars and women in Nashville. And, and, um, and I was really miserable with my life at that time. But but I've been thinking about it more recently and how at that time I was sort of a very public sinner in some ways. And I was kind of a secret Christian. Right. So I had this part of me that like I, I think God wants me to be a priest, but I'm going to like shove that part down. It's going to be a secret part of me. And I'm going to go like, you know, hook up with people and do all these things out in the world. And I got to a point where I was so miserable that I knew that I had to go back to our Lord. And and I, the only thing I knew that was true was at one time God wanted me to be a priest. And, and that's when I started asking questions about going to the seminary and, and doors just started flying open. And so I entered the seminary in 1999. And, uh, and, I, and when I entered the seminary, I think I became a very public seminarian with like a secret sinner self inside of me, you know, like then, then it was like, there was still that division in me, but now like now the, the sinful part of me is the part that's hidden and everything else is sort of out here in the public. 
And, and I did everything that I thought I needed to do. And I was making holy hours every day. And I was praying the rosary and I was doing devotions and I was reading five chapters of scripture a day. And I was doing all those things and I was coming to know our Lord. But I made a really serious mistake. And, and the mistake I made was that at a certain point as a seminarian and into my priesthood, I thought I was farther along in the spiritual life than I was. And, uh, and I sort of thought, you know, I'm kind of farther along in the spiritual life and, and the sinful parts of me, like the sins that I commit or the, the places where I don't experience freedom. Well, that's just kind of this thing on the side, but I'm, I'm, I'm really like surrendered to our Lord, but I just have this thing on the side. And, uh, and I think lots of us can fall into that. But our Lord is very clear when he says things like, you can't serve God and mammon. Right? You can't be in darkness and in the light at the same time. You know, what is in the darkness will come into the light. And, and so whatever split there is in us, like, that's the thing that needs to be healed. You know, when we ask questions like, like, what, what needs healing in my life? Well, well, like, what's that secret part of your life that you won't bring to our Lord? Um, or what's that part of your life that, that you don't want anybody to find out about? Um, like, what's that part of your life that you're ashamed of? Or, or the thoughts or the things you're t- attached to that you're ashamed of? Because those are the things that our Lord wants to set us free from. And uh, and it's like the woman at the, the Samaritan woman at the well, you know, our Lord goes and encounters her. And, uh, and he asks her, you know, give me a drink. And she looks at him and she's like, well, what's a Jew asking a Samaritan woman for a drink? Plus it's the middle of the day. Why are you talking to me? Stop talking to me. You know, and, um, and he, and he says, if you knew who was asking you, you would ask him and I would give you living water. And then she enters into this dialogue about this living water and finds out like she'll never be thirsty again. And she says, well, sir, give me that water so I don't have to come back to this well. And then he says to her, bring me your husband. Which is the most piercing question that he can ask. Bring me your husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. Well, you don't have one husband. You've had five husbands. The one you're with now is not your husband. Bring me your husband. Like, in other words, bring me the most shameful thing in your life. Bring me the thing that you don't want anybody to know about. Bring me the very reason that you're coming to this well in the middle of the day. And if you bring me that, then I'll give you this living water because there's something in you that's holding on to that secret. And it's getting in the way of letting me love you. And it's getting in the way of letting me love you. And, and it was when I was in grad school, finally, when I was in studying in Rome and I, and I was learning about love, marriage and family life and, and the church's teaching, which is so beautiful. And the beauty of the church's teaching, it was just agitating my heart into all kinds of ways. You know, like I didn't need to go looking for my wounds. Basically, I was encountering the gospel and my wounds started surfacing as I encountered the gospel. And... Um, and at that point in my life, I had to make a decision. And, and that decision that I had to make at that time was, you know, because I was kind of a mess. I was watching TV all day. I wasn't getting my work done. I was sort of looked like I had all my stuff together, but I really didn't have anything together. Um, I was falling back into old sins. And, uh, and I realized I had to make a choice. And the choice was I can either um, shove all those feelings down and shove that agitation down, whatever is uncomfortable, shove that down. And, uh, and throw myself into my work and I can become a really good academic curmudgeonly priest who doesn't really like people, right? Or I can take a risk to have joy, right? I can take a risk to have joy, but the risk to have joy means that I have to go to my bishop and ask his permission to go to therapy. And, uh, and I had a lot of anxiety about that because sometimes priests, sometimes priests go away to therapy and they never come back, you know, our father's on sabbatical and now he's a hospital chaplain in a hole in the ground in Western Nebraska, and, uh, and that's not really what I wanted for my life. And it's not what I thought our Lord wanted for my life. But I know I don't want to be the curmudgeonly priest who doesn't really like people. And so I went to my bishop and I asked his permission to go to therapy. And he was very good. And he was very kind. And he said, yes, like, and we agreed that I would go to Alma, Michigan that summer and, um, and start therapy. And, uh, and as I went through, my experience of therapy was that it helped me to understand what was wounded in my humanity. 
Um, like the question came up earlier about counseling and spiritual direction. And, and I really use the image of the cross and, and counseling kind of is about these horizontal relationships, our interpersonal relationships, how we deal with people, our emotions, like how we deal with our humanity. Spiritual direction is really meant to focus here on what's my relationship like with our Lord. And my experience was that I had a lot of kind of betrayal. I had parents who were divorced. I had people that I really trusted that let me down. Um, I've had priests in my life who were very influential that later left the priesthood or were removed from the priesthood. Um, and, and when enough things like that happen, it kind of breaks our trust muscle. And it, it's really hard for us to, to give our heart to anybody again because there's so much fear of what they're going to do with it. And, um, and so going to therapy helped me to, to be able to identify some of those things. And, and the more that I was able to understand that kind of human woundedness, which happened in counseling, then it freed me up to be able to enter into a new kind of relationship with our Lord. And it, it freed me up to allow our Lord to just encounter me right now as I am with my entire story and to recognize that, like, when our Lord tells my story, it's this story of, like, yeah, like, that guy's had a rough life, and he's fought and fought and fought, and he's working, he's worked really hard. And then finally he got it, and I was right there, and it was such a joy to bring him back to me. You know, and then our Lord has to tell that story again because I have a short memory and I forget sometimes, right? Because we all forget sometimes. And, and so, so going to counseling, like, helped to unlock a lot of that. And, um, and another area for, for consideration when we talk about freedom is, uh, is getting involved in 12-step groups if we need them. And, and I really think, like, I would just say if we're enslaved to sin, if we have an addiction, if we have an addiction that we just want to define as, like, I can't stop this by myself, especially in the area of purity, Finding a 12-step fellowship can be a path to learning how to live differently with our Lord. You know, St. Francis de Sales, when he talks about purity, he says, when fruits are whole, they may be stored up securely, some in hay, some in straw, some in sand, or in their natural foliage. But once bruised, they can only be preserved in sugar and honey. Right? Once bruised, they can only be preserved in sugar and honey. Even so, the purity that has never been tampered with may well be preserved to the end. But once it has been lost, it can only be preserved through the genuine devotion, which, as I have often said, is the very honey and sugar of the mind. And those words are arresting because what he's saying is that like, if our purity has been tampered with, the only way is the genuine devotion, which means the only way is a complete surrender of my heart to our Lord and a complete surrender of my heart to his love. That's it. That's the only thing. And, and so oftentimes, oftentimes there's just this part of us and we're like, yeah, Father, I get that, but I, I really just want to get better. Like, I, I need it. What can I do to get better? Or how can I make myself better? And then, and then I'll feel okay about the fact that God loves me because I think I kind of earned it. But that's not really how it works. Like, how it works is, like, our Lord just loves you. You know, and what's it like for our Lord to love you? What's it like for our Lord to make eye contact with you? You know, the other day, I, I just needed some time with our Lord, and I was out on my front porch, and I was praying my breviary, and then I was like, okay, I just got to talk to our Lord, and I started talking to him, and, and I'm talking about the Black Lives Matter protests, and I'm my bishop, and I'm talking about, like, the chancery things, and I'm talking about all these people I'm worried about, and as I'm doing this, I just have this image and prayer of our Lord grabbing my face and being like, Sean, I'm right here. Just look at me. Yeah, Jesus, but like, there's this thing over here, and, and there's this other problem I'm dealing with, and there's this other thing, and and I, I don't know how I'm going to get everything done. No, Sean, just look right here. Just look here. And he just wanted me to behold his face. Because his own desire for me at that time was just to let him love me.
And oftentimes, like, that is the thing we're not free to do is let our Lord love us for who we are right here, right now. In the entirety of our story. And so what 12-step fellowships do is they teach us how to do that, you know, and 12-step fellowships really are just an intentional way of living the Christian life. Um, and, and we can look at the Beatitudes and the 12 steps and, and say, like, the first Beatitude is blessed are the poor in spirit. And what does that mean? That means that I can't do anything on my own. I am useless to myself. Like, I can't fix this by myself. There's no amount of novenas or virtues or things like that I can develop. I just can't do it. I need help. In other words, like we recognize we were powerless over lust and our lives have become unmanageable, which is step one. The second beatitude is blessed are those who mourn. And and what do we have to mourn? Like if we really believe that we can't do anything on our own and we, we're going to give ourselves entirely to our Lord, then I have to start to mourn a lot of things. I have to start to mourn things about my freedom. I have to mourn the fact that I have to show up at meetings every week. I have to mourn the fact that I need a therapist. I have to mourn the fact that I'm going to give up this addictive behavior that's been my best friend for a really long time and was the source of all my consolation for a really long time. I have to grieve all of that. And then comes blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. And to be meek means I'm going to humble myself and follow somebody. I'm going to take direction. I'm going to allow the Lord to be the Lord of my life. We came, to, uh, we've, we turned our will and our life over to the care of God as we understood him. It corresponds to step three. In step two, we came to know that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Step four is um, we made a fearless and searching moral inventory of our lives, which corresponds to blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Because if I really hunger and thirst for righteousness, I want to, I want to get everything in my life straightened out. Mm. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So I'm going to admit to God myself and another person the exact nature of my wrongs. I'm going to make a list of all my defects of character. I'm going to ask God to remove those defects of character. And in that process, I receive mercy. You know, then comes blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. You know, And in a world where so many people struggle with freedom in the area of purity, we forget that blessed are the pure of heart for they shall see God is the sixth beatitude. And we have to learn to do all of the other ones because the other ones are about learning to be loved by our Lord and learning to rely completely on him and depend completely on him. And if I haven't got that, I'm not going to be able to do beatitude six. And then the rest of the steps and the 12 steps are just about discipleship and and continuing to take moral inventory and admit we're wrong to carry the message forth to others and stuff 12. And that process, maybe we become somebody who is persecuted for the sake of righteousness as we're preaching the gospel to others, you know? And so, so the 12 steps for me has actually just been a way of intentionally living the beatitudes and intentionally living in relationship with our Lord. And, and sometimes we want, we want all of our solutions to be like the Catholic packaged solution but the only solution is Jesus. The only solution is the face of Jesus. And sometimes his face shows up in the face of our therapist. Sometimes his face shows up in the face of a 12-step group. Sometimes it shows up as the face of a 12-step sponsor. You know, two weeks ago, we celebrated. It was the anniversary of my father's death. I was having a horrible day, just a horrible week. And and I checked this in at my, uh, at my priest meeting that I go to, our priest support group. And after the group, one of the guys called me up and he just like really showed a lot of care for me. And and that might have been the first time in a very long time that I tangibly experienced God's love through the love of this person that was reaching out to me that I know because because we're in group together. Our Lord can use all those things. And, and what I hope and my prayer for you, and, and as we go into adoration, you know, hopefully I've given you some things to ponder. Jason and Kristalina have given you some things to ponder. Um, but, but what I'd ask you to notice, and, and then I'll lead in a meditation, is, is just focus on how our Lord looks at you. And, and as our Lord looks at you, what, what happens in your heart? As our Lord looks at you do, you, do you start to feel nervous? Do you want to look away? What's that about? And just let him say those words to you, you know, whatever your name is. Like, I just want to look at you right now. And uh, 
maybe ask him what story he tells about your life and how how you're a part of the story of his life. And um, and just ask for the gift to, to completely surrender everything. And the grace that I pray for you is that you be stubborn about having joy. You know, our Lord says, I came that you may have life and have it more abundantly. And my own experience, like, um, I really have been grateful for the grace of perseverance and, and being stubborn about having joy, which means like if something's not working for me, I'm going to go find something else. And, and I'm, I'm going to be willing to use all the tools that Jesus wants to give to me in order to be free, in order to be loved, in order to experience, experience his love and experience that abundant life that he's called me to. Um, because the abundant life is the best evangelization tool that we have and the joy that we have is what's most attractive to others and and it is a gift that our lord desires to give to you and he desires us to be free to have open hearts to surrender to it and to receive it and to live it each day of our lives